Welcome to Decode Your Burnout, the podcast where we crack the code on burnout based on three primary factors, your programming, environment, and personality. We also feature experts who debunk the myths about what it takes to be successful in their industry and spin those tips to fit the workplace so you can optimize the way you work. I'm your host, Dr. Sharon Grossman, a psychologist turned coach, author, and burnout expert. If you're burned out and want to go from exhausted to extraordinary, book a free breakthrough session with me by going to bookachatwithsharon.com. And if you want to see how you're doing and what to focus on next, download the burnout checklist. You'll find the link in the show notes or go to bit.ly forward slash check your burnout. Now let's get started. Hello, Decode Your Burnout fans, and welcome to another episode with me, Dr. Sharon Grossman. And today I'm joined by Coach Jim Johnson. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sharon. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Now, for those of you who don't know Jim, based on what transpired in 2006, Jim Johnson is an authority on teamwork, leadership, and realizing your dreams. During what people call the miracle game, um, he helped an autistic high school senior realize his dream of playing with the team. Now, he was hoping for just one basket, and the rest of the country was then really amazed when Jason McElwain, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, scored 20 points in four minutes. Now, in his keynotes, dreams really do come true and leadership lessons from half court. Coach Jim inspires as he shares real world tools that can be implemented right away. He's appeared on Oprah, Good Morning America, and ESPN, and he's the author of the book, A Coach and a Miracle, Life Lessons from a Man Who Believed in an Autistic Boy. Now, I am so excited. This is such a great and inspiring little message just off the bat. I would love to hear a little bit more about what happened with this boy. It sounds amazing. Like it really does sound like a miracle, but I'm sure we'll find out that it's really about the coaching that you gave him. (laughs) (laughs) I wish it was all about the coaching, but uh, hopefully the coaching had a little factor. But Jason was a young man that came into our program in 10th grade. And he tried out for our JV team. And he was a real little guy. He was like five nine or five six, 100 pounds. And wow. he's on the autism spectrum. He's also learning disabled. But uh, my JV coach really, you know, we always talked about four factors in picking our team. Mm-hmm. And one factor he didn't have was the ability. You know, he wasn't very skilled in basketball. But he had some of the other factors that we looked at. We wanted people that were we over me poke people. We wanted people that we called the canai, that they want to constantly improve. And we wanted people that had a lot of passion for the game of basketball. And Jason fit those other three ingredients. So when my DB coach came to me and said, I want to offer this young man a chance to stay in our program by being our team manager. And that's what he did. And he that year and he would actually go to all the JV practices, but he would stay on the bench for the varsity games because the JV and varsity were back to back. And so I was starting to get to know him and he was just, we had a, because both of us had a great passion for basketball, he started to really fall in love with this kid. And so after his sophomore year, the thing that made him unique and two reasons, one is I never had a player other than Jason ever try out three straight years for our team and, and not make it. And secondly, was the fact that not only did he want to make the team, but he was willing to devote a lot of time and effort. He came to all our off-season workouts. So he tried it out again for the team I coached, the varsity, as a junior. He didn't make it, but he served as our team manager. And a little side note is I had been a fairly successful coach at that point, but I had the famous tag, I couldn't win the big one. We kept losing in our postseason tournament. In fact, Jason's junior, we went to the semifinals, which is the you know next step before the finals of our tournament. And that was the sixth time in my career we had taken a team there, but never won. And Jason's junior was no different. So his senior, when he came out, you know, he, he still, he had improved a lot, but, you know, our team, our program was pretty strong. And 
you know, so he wasn't good enough to make the team. But I told him I wanted to give him a gift for a senior year. And that was I was a, wanted to put him in for our final home game, which we call senior night. And as a kid, people periodically, he would ask me about that uniform. And of course, I define periodically as about every other day. So he, he was really excited to try to get well, it, the interesting thing. And I wrote a book about it. The first half of the season was the most difficult first half of the season I ever had in my career. We had a lot of internal strife. I share in the book, it's too long a story, but it really divided the team. And fortunately, with a lot of work from a lot of people, including myself and Jason, we got the team kind of straightened out. And so senior night was February 15th, and we uh, gave him a uniform on February 13th. He was really excited. In fact, there was a rumor going around school that he slept in it for two straight nights. Aww. He, he, he was pretty fired up. Well, senior night, for the, your listeners that don't know, that's where we honor all our senior players and also our senior cheerleaders before the game. We bring their parents or guardian out. But it was really profoundly touching to see Jason, instead of in his white shirt and black tie, which he usually brought to the games, he's now donning number 52, which, by the way, was way too big, but he didn't care. And to see him embrace his parents before the game in uniform is in memory I will always cherish. Well, the game begins, and we had a good student body following. There's a big video of the ESPN did. If you, as people want to look at it, it's about five minutes long. It's very touching. I use it as part of my presentation. But anyways, with about four minutes to go, I decided the time was right. My goal was, Sharon, I wanted to see if Jason could get in with enough time so he could score a basket. I thought if he could score a basket, it's a memory he'll have for the rest of his life. Well, I put him in. The first time he touches the ball, he has a three-pointer from the right corner. He lets it go. The crowd stands in anticipation. It misses by like six feet. Is that even close? And as I kid people, I know you're not supposed to pray in the public schools, but I was praying, dear God, please help him get one basket. Well, the yeah, great lesson we can all learn from Jason, though, is that how many times in our own lives, when we try something new or we get a new challenge and we fail miserably, how do we respond to it? Because Jason was a great lesson for us because he, he followed what we coached them on and that is what we call next play you got to be ready to move on learn from your mistakes but you got to move on quickly because game basketball is a quick game so he did and the next shot he got was actually a much closer shot and this time it hit the rim so I'm thinking all right God's starting to listen we're getting closer then the third time he makes a three-pointer and the place just goes bananas I'm thinking oh my gosh God must be a basketball fan (laughs) not only has Jason scored he's got a three-pointer it can't get better than this Well, for the next three minutes, as I kid people, his idol was the late, great Kobe Bryant. And he's turned into Kobe. He started making shot after shot. And I got to give you one quick fast forward. Five months after that game, Jason's in the ESPN Awards. He's up for the greatest sports moment of the year. And who is one of the other four finalists, Sharon? His idol, Kobe Bryant. Kobe had scored 81 points in an NBA game and also was up for the same award. And Amazing. Jason beat him out for the ESPY. Well, how did he do that? Well, he started making basket after basket. And the two things I'll never forget with about a minute to go, I'm sitting on the bench. Tears are flowing down my face. I can't believe what I'm seeing. And I get a tap on my shoulder and it's Jason's mother. And she is bawling her eyes out. And she whispers in my ear, Coach, this is the best gift you could have ever given my son. Of course, what would you do? I cried harder. I was so tough. <laughs> and then uh, how the game ends, Sharon, is really, uh, you'd almost think it's a movie. So our opponent, Spencer Port, and I want to give kudos to their players and their coach. They were good sports that night. But they score with under 10 seconds to go. And our player takes the ball out of bounds. But instead of throwing it to our point guard like he normally does, he throws it right to Jason. So Jason's dribbling down the court. And I just thought they would let him go in and make a short shot, a layup, what we call in basketball. But no, no, he adds more drama. He pulls up like two feet behind the three-point line, almost an NBA three because that's a further shot. And he launches his rainbow as I'm thinking, Jason, don't shoot from there. That's way too far. Swish, it goes in. The place explodes. They all run on the floor. Our players put him up on their, his shoulders. He's got the game over, over his head. And at this point, I have no idea how many points he has. And our public address announcer comes on and says, the leading scorer for the Trojans tonight, J-Mac, with 20 points. They literally scored 20 points in less than four minutes, which is absolutely crazy. People, you know, most people don't get 20 points in a game, let alone he got it in four minutes and a quarter. So it was pretty amazing. 
That is an amazing story. And thank you so much for sharing it. I mean, I got all teary eyed. I can only imagine what it was like for our listeners. So that is an incredible experience to have lived through. And it really does show what tenacity can do for people. Right. This kid did not give up on himself and he just kept showing up and kept showing up. And that's just amazing because I know so many people would have given up long before they would have said, well, you know, I have autism and I haven't made it in three years. Like he had every reason not to pursue it. It's failure after failure and rejection after rejection. And yet he kept showing up and showing up and showing up. And then he had his, you know, 20 minutes of fame, not 15. (laughs) Fantastic. I'll add one last thing. You know, it's funny. I mentioned that we had never won our championship in that year. So after that game, actually, the only reason we got publicity, because I didn't do it, you know, to get any publicity, but Jason's speech pathologist was at the game. He had never come to a game before. I didn't know him very well. And he actually called a local TV station and borrowed the video from me. And then, you know, within three days, it exploded all over the world. But the crazy thing is we had now I this media attention and we actually ended up jason had to go back as our team manager but he was so supportive we ended up winning our championship for the first time that year uh and jason then ended up coming back in my last nine years and helped me as a volunteer assistant we won five more so we had six championships we won in the last 11 years so it was pretty cool that's so good amazing amazing i love it so i know that one of the things that you talk about is you know speaking of championships you talk about building and sustaining championship cultures. Right. So tell us a little bit about what is a championship culture and is that something that's relevant also off of the basketball court? Yeah, well, I think, you know, leaders, you hear about it all the time. How do you build in sports? You call it the championship culture. In business, you can call it, you know, success culture, championship culture, you know, but people want a culture that a attracts other people. So I think it's really important as a leader that you're cognizant of the ingredients it takes to build a positive culture. And, you know, it works for different people in different ways. My leadership presentation, I talk about seven keys to being an effective leader to build this championship culture. And, uh, you know, I break it down in the first thing, as simple as we've heard it all the time, but I think leaders first got to know how to lead themselves. And so one of the things I talked about people is getting clarity about who they are. I really encourage people to develop their own personal mission statement and then try to live it. And then when you do that, you know, once you get better at leading yourself is then building a team atmosphere where you're building a team mission. For example, our mission for our team was to help develop winners on and off the court. And me is what I call myself the chief reminding officer is I was teaching our players, what does it take to be a winner on the court? Well, winning the game is part of that, but also are you a great teammate? Are you someone that can handle adversity and persevere? As you mentioned, Jason was a great illustration. Mm-hmm. Of that. Off the court, were you the best student you could be? Were you someone that can contributed to society and gave back to our community. So those are the things we were trying to build is develop winners. So that that started to build it. And as we started to have success on the court and doing things off the court, you know, what I believe is when you build this culture of success or championship level is then it attracts people. You know, people want to be part of something that's successful. And, it, you know, it was really interesting. I've done a lot of reflections since I've been retired and I still, you know, talk to leaders all the time is that are you continuing to grow as a leader and are you growing other leaders? Those are a couple of points I talk about, you know, what's your leadership philosophy? Our philosophy was to what we call leave a profit. Everything we touched we wanted to do, improve, not get worse. And so that was a concept. And I always give an illustration. When we would go to an opponent's high school to play a game, you know, we'd go into the other locker room to change before the game. And when I walk in, I would look, you know, is, is there any garbage on the locker room floor? And if there was, you know, I didn't put it there. You know, it was already there by somebody else from their school. But I would pick it up, you know, because I was teaching our players Everything we touch, we want to make better, you know, from picking up garbage off the locker room floor to, you know, how we perform in practice. And so those are things I think when you're talking about building a championship culture. And then one of the things, I mean, it's a big term you hear a lot, but I don't think people cultivate what it really means. And that is 
of servant leadership. And that's a concept that early on in my career, I really didn't have clarity. But it, what, uh, the last you know, 15 years, I was really big on trying to build leaders on my team, build my assistants to be, be become better leaders. Because the more you can develop leaders, and, and then empower them and delegate things, then you got to really, you know, what I call that championship culture. This is incredibly relevant, I think, to people in a corporate setting as well, yeah. based on what you, you're sharing here today. And so I just want to kind of recap a little bit of what you said, because it's, it really kind of was striking me how it, on and off the court, these things are are both true. So you started out by saying that we have to be able to lead ourselves. So we have to mm-hmm. develop our own personal mission statement. Mm-hmm. And I I want to bring this back to burnout for a second. And I feel like sure. sometimes I see different versions of burnout out there. Mm-hmm. I see yeah. some people are so in they they have that mission statement in the sense that they're they're very passionate about the work that they do. They're yeah. totally motivated. Their drive is through the roof and they're working super hard. Mm-hmm. But in that process, something falls apart. And usually it's because there's a lack of balance or because while they're focused on the mission of the organization and doing that work, they are lacking in that personal mission statement mm-hmm. in a more well-rounded way in terms of like how they define their value and their worth outside of work. And if it's like all of our eggs in that one basket, then we can certainly burn out. On the flip side, you have people who, when they're burned out, just feel like there is no mission, there is no purpose, there is no meaning. And so that lack of meaning and purpose can make it hard to find the motivation to show up to work. And sometimes it's because they, like, for instance, I was talking to somebody yesterday, he was sharing how he's just under challenged. Sometimes Mm -hmm. the work that we do is just not suitable for our level or skills. and, And it's, we're not passionate about it. And it could be because we're misaligned or something has changed and now we have negative associations with that change in the organization. So for whatever reason, I think it's great to be able to ground yourself back to this idea of developing your personal mission, being well-rounded in that mission, and then seeing how you align with, you know, your personal mission with that team mission. And for leaders in particular, I think it's important, as you say, to continue to grow as a leader. Mm -hmm. And what you shared with Jason is he had that desire to constantly improve himself. So there's that growth mindset, which is so important, both in terms of being a championship player, team player, as a, as a, as well as being a championship leader of a winning team. Right. right? And I love your concept of um, making everything you touch better. And that's certainly something that I always try to do whenever I go. I I often think about that when I'm in like a public bathroom, because it's usually a disgrace. (laughs) I just throw things everywhere. So I'm always like throwing things in the garbage and wiping down things and you know, trying to make it a little bit more pleasant for the next person, you know, so there's, there's yeah. that mentality of like, you know, I am coming to utilize these services, but I will also make it better than the way I found it when I first got here. Right? right. And then that servant leadership is so important because so many times, especially as I work with CEOs, I see that or entrepreneurs, right. Is they don't delegate enough. They think like they're the only ones that can get the work done. It's that perfectionistic mindset that leads them to have to control everything. And then they're so overwhelmed with all the things that they have to do that they can easily burn out. So I think all of these things are super, super helpful. Now with that, I know that you have uh, three myths that you're going to debunk for us in terms Mm -hmm. of what it takes to really be successful with building a championship culture. So what's that first one for you? So the first one is all people should be a leader of teams. Okay. And, and I, you know what, uh, as I've evolved and learned a lot about leadership is, you know, there, uh, I think the first step in life is what I call an individual contributor. You know, for example, a, a salesperson, okay, that may end up being really good as a salesperson and for a number of them, that's where they should stay. That's their strength zone. 
that's where they, you know, they, they really flourish. And yet uh, often in the corporate world, you see where you, okay, I've got to be promoted and now I'm the sales manager. And often that person ends up being what we call the sales mangler because they, they don't have that skill set. And some of them do not want to do this skill set because they are totally different. When you're an individual contributor, there are certain things you need to do to be successful in that way, you know, sales being an example. But leading a team is just a complete change of mindset because now you've got to be thinking of the team first over your needs. You've got to be thinking about how can I grow these people to work as a team, to develop their leadership, to use their strengths so that we can accomplish common goals together. And, and that's a really big change for a lot of people. So I don't think all people should be leaders of teams. Because of that, I think it's fine to be an individual contributor and stay in that. Now, if you do want to get in teams, then you really got to study what it is to build a championship culture, how to be a better leader. You know, and I do think, though, it does start with modeling the behavior you want. You know, I always talk about, you know, I want to expect my players to be in shape. Well, I was always in shape because I, I put time in my schedule where I was going to work out. Another thing is, you know, we were one of my non negotiables if you couldn't be on time them be early. Well, you know, if I said that in our practice started at seven o'clock, I never walked in right at seven o'clock. I was always there early because I was trying to set a standard for what we expected of our people on our team. So I think those are things you really got to think about is are you modeling the behavior that you expect to see out of your people? And often, you know, if you don't align your words and actions, because another thing I always talk about in leadership is you got to be able to build trust with your team. And if you, one of our three key principles in building trust that hurts you is when your words and actions don't align. I mean, you know, if I say one thing and I do completely the opposite, that really hurts your trust. Yeah. So it makes me think back to what you were saying is you need to first have that personal mission. And if your personal mission isn't to be a leader, then don't feel compelled to do it just Absolutely. because. Yeah. Because it's not for everyone. And it makes me think yeah. about like, not everyone is cut out to be an entrepreneur. Right, exactly. It's exactly. the same, yeah. right? Being an entrepreneur yeah. is being some version of a leader. Like you're yeah. in charge of all the things and you have right. to create it and make it. And it's not for everybody. No, it's not. Definitely not. You know, so yeah. it's, you know, I, I don't like to tell people to stay in their lane, but, you know, you have to know what your strengths are, what your passions are. And if that's not it, that's okay. Not yeah. everybody can lead. Like we need also followers. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we definitely do. And, you know, and that's the same, you know, in my profession, often assistant coaches were great assistants, but then some of them named head coaches and that transfer didn't work well for them because that was a different set of responsibilities right. that they didn't want to embrace. So. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Okay, so that's myth number one. Okay. What's number two? Number two is to build a championship culture, you must follow a certain formula. And although I do believe that there are expectations, standards that you need to set as a leader, they got to be what is important to you and also building the core values of yourself. Again, leading yourself, you know, what are your most important core values and what are, how does that align with the core values of your team? And then teaching them and living them again, being your example to start. And then also getting people to buy in to the team mission. Is there, do they know that, you know, we, I know you've worked with the leaders and executives of businesses, you know, a lot of them have mission statements, but then you ask, you know, one of the, someone on the team, what, what's the mission statement for your business? And they look at you like you got two heads. They have no idea, you know? And so it's nice to be able to develop a mission statement, but then there's got to be, I always share with leaders, you got to be the CRO, the chief reminding officer. You got to be living it. You got to be sharing it in different ways consistently if you can get, and then get people to buy into that. So why I say, is there's no set formula because, you know, your core values and my core values could be completely different, you know, but research shows us that, you know, there's companies that have been extremely successful that would have core values that I wouldn't agree with. I know there's a couple tobacco companies. I'm not a smoker, so 
I'm not supporting that. But you know what? They they believe in their product. They have their core values. They stay with it. And there's a couple of tobacco companies that are still doing extremely well if you look mm-hmm. at their numbers. Okay. Now that wouldn't be what my ideal of success is, but if you look at the metrics, they would be successful, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that those are the things is you got to develop what's your core values, what you're going to live with, and, and then developing your system and getting people and, you know, that contribute to that system. Like you mentioned, and I think it's so important, is understanding as a leader your strengths. And sometimes you got to go out of your strength zone. I'm not saying that. I definitely did. But you're trying to work more in your strengths and then bringing in your staff that have strengths where you don't have strength. And the same with players. You know, one of the things that really changed for me is when I would ask my players more for input. And they had great input. You know, like often when we come off on the floor in a timeout, I immediately say, you know, what are you seeing out there? What do you think we need to change? You know, I mean, I had some ideas, but I wanted to hear from them. And then if we're on the same page, or I'd say, you know what, uh, you know, I, I agree with that, but we need to do this as well. So, you know, but I think getting contributions from people and being comfortable not because I know early in my career, I was not so, I, you know, I wanted to micromanage everything. Everything had to be that way. No, it's got to be uh, one of the best things I learned, Sharon, and I share it all the time now, is the best leaders, I believe, are always looking for the best answers, not necessarily their answers. And that's a huge thing because most leaders, including myself, we have egos and we think we know all the answers. And you know what? I know I don't, and I know pretty much every leader doesn't, so. Great. So, I mean, that's a great reminder for us because it is, as I said, sometimes hard for people to let go of control, and there is that ego piece that keeps us thinking, like, if it's coming from someone else, it's going to take something away from me, and that's absolutely not true. When you're thinking about a team, you've got all of these people who have ideas and thoughts and the more of that you tap into, the more success your team can actually have. It's, it's just, you know, Absolutely. it's just math. So actually, let me share just one real quick story. Mm-hmm. One year we had a, we were in a very close game. We were in New York state. We were playing in a Christmas tournament in Pennsylvania and we were playing a re- the host school. They were really good. We were really good too. And it came down and I'm getting a little bit technical, but you know, we played most predominantly man-to-man defense. And so in the last time out, we were up by two points. And my assistant coach said to me, you know, coach, they will not be ready if we go to zone. And I thought for a moment, I said, you know what, he's absolutely right. And we went to a zone and they were completely confused. And we ended up winning that game because they just didn't know what to do. And the interesting thing is after that, I, you know, one of the newspaper writers and the first thing I did is I, the key was my assistant made a great suggestion and helped us win the game. You talk about a nice way to build a culture is when you can praise the people that are making those contributions. Yeah. And I, I think um, what you just did is something that's actually very important when it comes to burnout, because a lot of times people burn out for not getting acknowledged enough. Yes and feeling unrecognized for all of their efforts. So this is also a shout out to everybody out there who is a leader to please take the time and recognize your players, your teammates, your, um, your assistants, anybody who is under you because they look up to you for that. And it's really important in keeping them from burning out. Super important. can I just add one thing because you're so wrong is that the other thing that I really try to teach leaders is not don't just say, I mean, it's nice to hear a nice job, Sharon. Okay. Right. But that gets old because there's no specificity to it, you know? So I always teach leaders. I always give an illustration instead of saying nice job, Johnny, you know, from one of my players, I would say, Johnny, that was great hustle. I love how you dove on the floor for a loose ball. That's what championship players do for championship teams. Now he's very clear about, you know, what I praised him for. So. And when you said that, it made me think about like how effective feedback would even be with your kids. Yes. You know, to say like, I loved how you made your bed this morning because that's what, you know, really 
organized children do or something yes, like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're building so right. really important habits, something yeah, like yeah, that. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. And I know you got one more for us. Yeah. So, so the last one is you need how to need a, you need to learn how to lead others before you lead yourself. And, and we did talk about this, but I'll just reinforce is that I think it's just really difficult. Number one, if you, you can't lead yourself, if you're a mess, it's very tough. So, you know, you got to start organizing some rituals and routines that you do to be effective. So you can be a model for the people you lead. And then, but then I do say the huge thing is if, if you want to take on the responsibility of leading a team, then you got how to really change that mindset. Well, you know, we always talked about our players, the we over me. And it starts with you as the leader. You know, are you a we guy? Are you thinking of, of what's best for the team, not just best for you? And that's a very difficult transition for a lot of leaders. So you got to have clarity that, you know, now you got to be thinking of what's best for the team. And I'll give you one quick illustration that's really important because, you know, people, we always talk about, you know, you want feedback. And, and I got much better in the second half of my career getting feedback from my assistants, getting feedback from my, my uh, players. And one of the things that I, I, I teach people is that, you know, when you ask for feedback, you have to acknowledge now the key is you can't use all the feedback. It's just virtually impossible, but you got to respect. So I always would say, let's say Joey comes to me and says, you know, we should do this, this and this, and I'll think it over and I'll come back to Joey and I say, Joey, I really appreciate your feedback. Right now, I don't think this is the right way to do this. And here's why. Now, they may not totally agree with what I say, but at least they know I, they were heard and that I considered it, and here's the reason we didn't use it. Because you want to hear from them, because a lot of times I did use their ideas, but if you didn't, at least show the respect that you listened to them, and this is why we didn't do this. Right, and so taking it back to the parenting example, it's kind of like the opposite of when parents say, because I told you so. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that. Exactly, exactly. So, so really great points. You've shared so much with us. And I want to come back to three things that you said with regards to Jason. And we talked a little bit about growth mindset that yeah. really stood out to me. One was that he wanted to constantly improve. Yep. Two is he was willing to devote time and effort. And three, you talked about next play to move on quickly from mistakes. I think those are three things that can help anybody who wants to really build a championship mindset for themselves. Yep. Cause as you say, it's about leading yourself before you lead other people. Yeah, so sure. thank you so much for coming on. I loved all of your stories. It's very, very inspiring. And coach Jim, where can people find you if they want to hire you as a speaker or they want to work with you in some capacity? Sure. So it's pretty simple. It's coachjimjohnson.com. I'm there. I do have a free newsletter that we send out monthly. We also have a weekly blog that is free. I also have a YouTube channel, Coach Jim Johnson, that I do a, a lot of weekly videos. And certainly it has all the information they, they can reach out. And, and I'm, I'm okay because if I can help any of your listeners, I'll give you my personal email, which is jjhoops at rochester.rr.com if there's anything i can help somebody personally with certainly all the information i do work with a great lady named kate holgate and you know so there's any way we can help you with one of our presentations or programs and, and our information on the book and i'm actually working on a second book with a college professor to help leaders when they take over their first leadership position so that's kind of our focus cool. on one of the things i'm doing my life right now so exciting well yeah I mean, thank you again it's been really really fun to take this new approach kind of with the podcast and so i'm sure people would appreciate the kind of newness of it now i just want to check in for all of you thinkers out there what did you think of the show if you are a feeler how did hearing this make you feel and for all you doers out there what are you going to do different based on what you've heard now regardless of what your personality code is my goal is to spread the word that burnout is a unique experience and by decoding it you can find solutions that are equally unique to you 
Help me spread this message by subscribing to the show on Apple or Spotify and leaving us a review telling us what you think, feel, or do different because of the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can leave me a comment or questions to answer in future episodes. And please recommend the show to anyone struggling with burnout. If you are ready to take the next step with me to decode your burnout, go to decodeyourburnout.com and I'll see you right back here next week. Take care.